I want to talk to you this morning about the canon of the New Testament. Did the ancient church muzzle the canon? And what we mean by the canon is those books that belong in the text of the New Testament, the 27 books that we would call the New Testament Scripture. And I'm addressing the issue of the story behind the apocryphal gospels, those gospels that were written later, like the Gospel of Thomas, like the Gospel of Philip and Mary and Judas and uh, Peter, all sorts of ancient works were written that uh, never made it into the canon, and I want to wrestle with you as to why that is. And so I want to start by talking to you about the impulse for apostolic authorship. The church, the early church, obviously wanted to see its books written by apostles, if at all possible. What's really significant here is that all of our gospels were originally anonymous works. They did not have the names of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, on them. They only put those names on as soon as somebody came across two gospels and they said, well, this gospel is different from this one, so what do we call it? And there was a good sense, a good tradition already that went back to the original authors, I believe, where they said, this is the gospel according to Matthew and this is the one according to Mark, etc. But those works were anonymous. Now, when you get into the second century, what's really interesting is that anonymity seems to disappear. You have the Gospel of Thomas, and it says it's by Thomas right from the get-go. The Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Judas, and all these other works where those apostolic names were uh, put onto the books to give them an authority that they did not otherwise have. And so there is this impulse for apostolic authorship where the church wanted to see that, but they... Uh, they stopped short, the Orthodox Church stopped short if there was not really enough evidence to argue for that. And so consequently, our second gospel, the Gospel of Mark, uh, the earliest tradition suggests that Mark got that gospel from Peter himself. And yet no one, no one called this the gospel according to Peter. It was the gospel according to Mark. And consequently, this is one of the evidences that really helps us to understand why the New Testament books are in and other books are not. Those books had a certain intrinsic authority to them that was recognized by the church, while the other books that were trying to get into acceptance by the uh, uh, Christian community in the second century didn't have that intrinsic authority. So if you're gonna write a book and you're writing a hundred years after some apostle died, and you want to present those ideas as though they were by that apostle, how do you get it to be accepted? Well, you put his name on it. And then say, hey, I found this in the attic of my house, and uh, here it's an old book, and this must really be by Thomas. So that's the impulse that we see in the second century especially. Now, there were numerous books besides the 27 in the New Testament that were attributed to apostles and their associates. As already mentioned, there's the Gospels of Thomas and Mary and Philip and Judas and Peter and Bartholomew, all sorts of works that were not really by these people. There's also other kinds of books like the Acts of Peter and Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. You all read that in your New Testament, right? Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. Uh, and 3rd Corinthians. Uh, not just 1st and 2nd Corinthians, but 3rd Corinthians. What's interesting is a lot of these works were completely Orthodox, that is, they conform to what we would say is what the church should believe and has believed from the beginning. But they still never were part of the scriptures, never part of the New Testament. Well, I want to discuss with you briefly what the criteria of canonicity were. These criteria were three things, essentially, that the early church uh, followed in terms of thinking about what books belonged in the canon. The first and most important criterion was apostolicity. That is, was a book written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle? Now, another way to think about this is this is the criterion of antiquity. And by the way, what I'm gonna share with you is not just a history lesson. These are things that we need to think about today. When the Gospel of Judas was published a couple of years ago, people were wondering, well, should we put this into the New Testament or not? Well, when you start reading it, you realize it really does not look very uh, uh, orthodox. But even apart from that, should it go in there? What if it were an orthodox document? And one of the criteria that we look at is apostolicity. Was this really written by an apostle or an associate of an apostle? And there is no scholar today who thinks that Judas actually wrote the gospel according to Judas. So it loses on this first criterion. 
Secondly is the criterion of orthodoxy. Does it conform to what we see in the, uh, uh, from the other books as to what was orthodox or true doctrine? And essentially what the idea there is, they go back to the words of Jesus that are found in the Gospels. And that became kind of the canon or the standard that the early church followed for what was orthodox. And then finally is Catholicity. And by that I don't mean Roman Catholicity, but that the books were accepted by all the churches. These three criteria guided the church in deciding or really discovering what books belong to the New Testament. Now there's a diff different definition of the canon between Catholics and Protestants. Roman Catholics would say the canon is an authoritative list of books. Protestants would say it's a list of authoritative books. Now let me say those again and, and just, it's where you put the word authoritative that is key. Is the canon an authoritative list of books or a list of authoritative books? Well, if it's an authoritative list of books, then we need to see some authority that grants that uh, authority to the scriptures. And when you look at the universal church councils, there's not a single council that says this is what is scripture. So there was never a church council that said these are the books, no universal council that said these are the books that go into the New Testament. So we don't have some kind of an authoritative list of books. There's also a problem with the Catholic definition of this, and that is if you say there's an authoritative list, then there must be some authority that's higher than the New Testament or the scriptures that gives the New Testament that authority. There actually is an authority higher than the New Testament, but it's not tradition, it's not church councils, it's Jesus Christ himself. He is the canon. He is the standard that the New Testament conforms to. And uh, that's, that's really what the idea of uh, canon is, is a standard. And so I think what we have for the New Testament books are a list of authoritative books. William Barclay, the great uh, scholar at Edinburgh University for many years, said that the New Testament books were not the sort that people actually could determine what belonged in the New Testament. Rather, they were the sort of books that no one could keep them from getting into the New Testament. They had this intrinsic authority to them that we finally have recognized. And I think that's uh, important for us to, to realize they have the ring of truth to them. As we read them, they just seem to bear witness to something that is more important, greater, we might even want to call it inspired that uh, is part of the text. And so these are the three criteria that were used. Now, what this means is that the early church did not determine which books went into the canon. What the church did was discovered which books were in the canon. And therefore, the Spirit of God guided the church in these decisions in conformity with who Jesus Christ is. So, one of the questions that we want to ask, and we're going to ask two questions this morning, is how did the ancient church view forgeries? Some of you may have heard of the book uh, by Bart Ehrman called Forged, and I think the subtitle is uh, Why the Books of the Bible Were Not Written by the People We Think uh, Wrote Them, something along those lines. Bart Ehrman is um, a man who teaches at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's a Moody and Wheaton graduate who over the years uh, abandoned the evangelical faith, then abandoned the faith altogether, became an agnostic, and one of his recent books called God's Problem says, if there is a God, it is certainly not the God of the Bible because that's a Nazi deity. So you can see he has kind of a, not an ambivalent relationship to uh, uh, evangelical Christianity, a hostile relationship. But one of the things he's done in this recent book, Forged, is said something that consistent evangelicals have been saying for decades, and it's very exciting to see a liberal scholar agree with us, and uh, I'll, I'll show you what, uh, what the issue is here. Well, how did the ancient church view forgeries? If they discovered that a book was not written by the person who, who claimed to, to write it, that was attributed to it, they would always throw it out. That book is to be rejected. It doesn't matter if it's squeaky clean, orthodox, uh, agrees with the Westminster Confession of Faith or Biola's doctrinal statement, it didn't matter. The fact is that that book was not part of scripture. So in the second century, there was a letter that was discovered called Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. What it was was a pastiche from four different letters that Paul wrote. And in the doctoral program at uh, Dallas Seminary, when I took canon, uh, we go over that letter. We actually translate it in class and discuss it and discuss why this should not be part of the canon. 
It's completely orthodox. It's quotations from four of Paul's letters, but it's not written by Paul. It was written in the second century, so it did not go into the canon. There's 3 Corinthians. 3 Corinthians is also orthodox, and it was written by a man who, when he did it, he did it because he said, I really love the Apostle Paul, and so I put his name on it. So when it was discovered that he wrote this letter as a forgery, he was kicked out of the church, and 3 Corinthians was considered not scripture. Then there's the Epistle of Barnabas, which is considered one of the Apostolic Fathers documents. It is largely orthodox in its views. That is, it's, it, it uh, has evangelical uh, doctrine to it, its basic perspective. But nobody thought it was written by Barnabas. And in fact, they said, this is a, a good book. It's important to read. In the, in the Muratorian Canon, which is an early list of what the uh, books of the scriptures were in the second century, it said, Epistle of Barnabas is good. We should read this book but it's not scripture because it was written in our time, second century. So that's a major criterion. And so if someone wants to say to you, well, why doesn't this book go into the canon? Or you'll hear people say, there's these lost books of the Bible that never made it in and, and the early church suppressed them. You've all heard that kind of thing. Well, the fact is the early church didn't suppress them because we're talking about first century documents. And the first century documents are those that are written by apostles or the associates, and those are in the scriptures. There were a couple of other books that were apparently orthodox but did not make it in, and we don't even have those anymore. The Epistle to the Hebrews, which was apparently an orthodox book, but we only uh, uh, read about it, but not uh, read it, we don't read it. So the, the early church did not view these forgeries as benign forgeries. They were guilty of pseudepigraphal or of lying. Dr. Earl Ellis, who was at Southwestern Baptist Seminary for, towards the end of his career, wrote this in one of his most important recent books. In the patristic church, apostolic pseudepigrapha, when discovered, that is, books that were allegedly by the apostles but really were not, these are forgeries, were excluded from the church's canon. This applied whether or not the pseudepigrapha were orthodox or heretical. Very, very important point. And then he goes on and says, the hypothesis of innocent apostolic pseudepigrapha, or what I call benign forgeries, appears to be designed to defend the canonicity of certain New Testament writings that are, at the same time, regarded as pseudepigrapha. There are scholars who would say, Peter did not write 2 Peter, but we still keep it in the scripture. Paul did not write Ephesians or the pastoral epistles, but we still keep it in the scripture. And what uh, Earl Ellis is saying is, no, that is not a valid approach. It's a modern invention that has no evident basis in the attitude or writings of the apostolic and patristic church. And that's the position that Dr. Bart Ehrman also agrees with, that the ancient church never accepted these forgeries once they discovered they were forgeries. Now where Ehrman disagrees with Ellis is he thinks most of the books of the New Testament were forgeries. And Earl Ellis does not agree with that at all. So the second question is, how do the ancient forgers view Christ? And you've, you've heard about these books, but they can, they can nod at you, they can scare you if you have never read them. And so I'm gonna give you some excerpts from some of these ancient forgeries that are most fascinating, really. And I would encourage you, read this literature. It's, uh, it's nothing we should be afraid of. We should never be afraid to pursue the truth. The infancy gospel of Thomas, which is different from the gospel of Thomas, we read this. When a boy accidentally ran into the boy Jesus, Jesus declared, you shall not go further on your way. And the child immediately fell down and died. That's the kind of Jesus that I wanted to play with as a kid. (laughs) Some of the villagers complained to Joseph, asking him to take his family and leave. Since you have such a child, you cannot dwell with us in the village, or else teach him to bless and not to curse, for he has slain our children. Did you ever know Jesus was like that as a kid? I don't think I want this book in my canon. When you begin to read the apocryphal works, you get, I think, the sense of the Spirit of God who shows you what the ring of truth is. These books don't have it. These books, the 27 that belong in the New Testament do. Then in the Arabic infancy gospel, which was written in the fifth or sixth century, and by the way, there is some evidence that the Quran is acquainted with this particular document and that uh, uh, Muhammad really 
had awareness of these apocryphal gospels far more than he did of the New Testament. It's a very interesting situation. So his reflections on the New Testament are skewed through the data of these apocryphal gospels. Well, this is written in the fifth or sixth century, and we read of the mischievous child Jesus. One day he goes into a dyer's workshop, and he puts all the cloths into a cauldron that is full of indigo. It ruins the cloths. When the dyer finds out, he says to Jesus, what have you done to me, son of Mary? You've ruined my reputation in the eyes of all the people of the city, for everyone orders a suitable color for himself, but you have come and spoiled everything. But the child Jesus responds, I will change for you the color of any cloth which you wish to be changed. When Jesus performs this miracle, the villagers are amazed and they praise God. But unlike any miracle in the canonical gospels, this is one that Jesus did to make up for the trouble he had caused. And so it's not the same Jesus that we read about in the gospels. Another time he had playmates in this Arabic infancy gospel that he turns into goats. And then he starts playing a tune on, on a, uh, some instrument and they, uh, uh, on a flute, I think, and they start dancing around him just to entertain him. And then he turns them back into children and they're happy again. So it's better than the internet. It's amazing, Joe. You know, so. <laughs> the Gospel of Thomas is one you've all heard about. The Gospel of Thomas was discovered in 1945 in Nag Hammadi in Egypt along with a number of other books. This is an extremely important work. And before I show you one saying from it, the last saying in the book, I want to tell you a little bit about this. It does say it's by Thomas, Thomas Didymus. Didymus means the twin. And there was an early tradition, when I say early, I mean second century, not first century, that Thomas was Jesus' twin. And so in the Syriac church and in, in the Coptic church, to some degree, there was a, a hint that that might be the case. Well, this book is not technically Gnostic. You've, you may have heard of Gnosticism, where the idea was salvation comes by way of knowledge, and that the material world is evil, the spirit world is good. By the way, the Gospel of Judas is thoroughly Gnostic. And in the Gospel of Judas, it says, Judas uh, is told by Jesus, you need to betray me, but you will be a hero for doing so, because you will set my spirit free, or you will set me free, from this shell in which I am stuck. In other words, you will set me free from my material realm. And so in the Gospel of Judas, Judas is viewed as a hero by Jesus because spirit is good and material, including the body, is evil. It's thoroughly Gnostic, completely uh, in tune with Gnostic ideas. You probably have heard of the Jesus Seminar. It was a group of 84 scholars that met for about eight years just to discuss what the words of Jesus were. And this particular group, headed up by Robert Funk, uh, met uh, in uh, Chico, uh, California, and they voted on whether Jesus said something or not. They'd throw in red beads uh, into a, a, a pool. If he said it, that meant, yes, this is a red letter edition. He really said these words. Pink beads they'd throw in if they said the thoughts go back to Jesus, but not the words. Gray meant, well, we don't think the thoughts or the words go back to Jesus, and black beads meant we know the thoughts and the words did not go back to Jesus. Now, I have a set of those beads that Bob Funk gave to me because he and I worked on a, on a project for several years, not the Jesus Seminar, but another project. And so I've got those uh, framed in my house. Um, and all they are is the little dowel pins that you put in when you screw uh, a screw in. We've got them on the edges of these uh, seats, I think, or someplace in here. Uh, when you screw a screw into wood and you have to cover it up, it's a dowel uh, pin at the uh, end. He spray painted those in his garage, passed them out to these scholars. And I used to call him the Cecil B. DeMille of biblical scholars because he would get all sorts of people together to make these points. And I, I, one time I said, Bob, I'm amazed how you could get these 84 scholars to come together every year to work on this thing. And he said, I did it for a particular reason. I did it because any time an evangelical wants to counter what I'm saying, if he doesn't have 84 scholars who back him up, then I can just discount what he's done. So that's why he had this strategy. Well, in the Gospel of Thomas, or in the, in the five Gospels that was published by the Jesus Seminar, it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Thomas. And it's a translation of these books. It's a really nice translation, but it has the red and the pink and the gray and the black for all the words of Jesus throughout. 
The Gospel of Thomas has more read in it than the Gospel of John. It has more read in it, that means more words of Jesus that are authentic than the Gospel of Mark. It has more red letters in it than the Gospel of Matthew. Luke is the only one that has more than the Gospel of Thomas as far as uh, the Jesus Seminar is concerned. So when you go through this thing, what you discover is there's no narrative of the life of Jesus. Not one city, not one place is mentioned. His resurrection is not mentioned. There's no miracles that he does. What you see is kind of a talking head gospel. And when you get to the very end, you see a discussion between Peter and Mary Magdalene, and then Jesus interrupts the discussion. Simon Peter said to them, to the rest of the apostles, let Mary leave us because women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, look, I shall lead her so that I will make her male in order that she also may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. You want that in your New Testament? Ladies, do you want that in your New Testament? This is so politically incorrect. Anytime I talk to somebody who actually says, we think the Gospel of Thomas should go into the New Testament and replace the Gospel of John, then I say, well, saying 114 is a bit of a problem for me. And so I'll quote this to them, and then they'll say, well, that's not authentic. It really isn't part of the original Gospel of Thomas. I said, look, we have one copy of the Gospel of Thomas, and it's in there. How, how do you say it's not part of it? It's, well, there's some problems with these apocryphal gospels. They were late, sometimes centuries later than the New Testament. But the key is that they were late. They were second century documents or later, even as late as the eighth century. Secondly, although they were popular with the masses, church leaders rightfully condemned them as silly and sometimes as heretical. And they usually contained docetic or Gnostic ideas of Jesus, which is essentially a separation of the material world from the spiritual world. One is good, one is evil. By the way, Docetic ideas had to do with Jesus only appears to be human, but he really is divine. One of the struggles of the second century church was not with the deity of Christ. They believed in the deity of Christ. What they weren't so sure about was the humanity of Christ. And let me show you in some of these other apocryphal books. In the Acts of John, John says, sometimes when I meant to touch him, speaking about Jesus, I met with a material and solid body. But at other times when I felt him, his substance was immaterial and incorporeal, as if it did not exist at all. This is before the resurrection, you understand. And I often wished, as I walked with him, to see his footprint, whether it appeared on the ground, for I saw him, as it were, raised up from the earth, and I never saw it. That's not the historical Jesus. That is not the incarnate God who becomes man to dwell among people. It is similar to the Gospel of Peter that has Jesus coming out of the tomb at his resurrection and he's got his head above the clouds and then there's two angels apparently that are uh, walking beside him or who are also hundreds of feet tall. And I think I saw a picture of this on one of your buildings down that way, isn't that the... Uh, the <laughs> as soon as I saw that, I thought, oh, that's from the Gospel of Peter. I, why does Viola have this here? But anyway, um, I never knew Jesus was that tall. Now, the Acts of Paul is one of my favorites. Paul is facing down the gaping jaw of a large lion in the Ephesian amphitheater, which seats 24,000 people and still there today. Unshaken, Paul approaches the beast and he simply reminds the creature that he had baptized it after the lion uttered his confession of faith, of course. And so Paul jumps on the lion and they run away from the amphitheater. You know, you get a sense that these books are loony, they're bizarre, they, they embellish things, and when you read this literature, you go back and you read the New Testament and you say, it's really subdued. When they even talk about the miracles of Jesus, they give you great details, but they don't have a lot, they, they don't have this embellishment that goes all over the map and says, uh, we have a Jesus that's hundreds of feet tall when he comes out of the, uh, uh, the grave, that kind of a thing. Well, by way of conclusion, the canonical gospels and most of the rest of the New Testament books were accepted from the earliest period. 20 of the 27 books were accepted in the second century by all people uh, throughout the church and then the other seven it took some time. Uh, but everything was accepted by the fourth century. They were not given to bizarre embellishments as we just saw some of these other books do. 
and they proclaimed Jesus of Nazareth as both man and more than a man. The ancient church accepted books into the canon because of apostolicity, orthodoxy, and Catholicity. All detected forgeries, if they were orthodox, were automatically rejected. And of course, if they were not orthodox, they were also rejected, but forgeries did not make it. The ancient church's criteria should guide Christians today as well, I believe. And so I wanted to share this with you so you can have some sense that God has been working in his church for 20 centuries. The ultimate authority, the canon that determines the canon of the New Testament is Jesus Christ himself working through the spirit who works in the church. And we can trust the Lord that what we have in our New Testament today is exactly what God wanted to go there. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your goodness to us. We are grateful for Jesus Christ. And we're grateful that he is the canon that we measure all things by. He is the standard of holiness, of righteousness, and truth. And he is the standard for the books of the New Testament. Because they magnify him, because they are written by associates of apostles or by the apostles themselves, we realize that these are the books that need to go there, and they are the ones that need to guide our lives. Help us not to stray from your scriptures, but to be men and women of the book whose lives are touched because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.